three cities shall be designated beyond the Jordan and three and the other three shall be designated in the land of Canaan. They shall serve as cities of refuge. These six cities shall serve the Israelites and the resident aliens among them for refuge uh, so that anyone who kills a person unintentionally may flee there. Now comes 16 and the change of topic. Anyone, however, who strikes another with an iron object so that death results is a murderer and murderers must be put to death. If he stuck, struck him with a stone tool that could cause death and death resulted, he is a murderer. The murderer must be put to death. Similarly, if the object with which uh, he struck him was a wooden tool that could cause death and death resulted, he is a murderer. He must be put to death. The blood avenger himself shall put the murderer to death. It is he who shall put him to death upon the encounter. So too, if he pushed him in hate or hurled something at him on purpose and death resulted, or if he struck him with his hand in enmity uh, and death resulted, the assailant shall be put to death. He is a murderer. The blood avenger shall put the murderer to death upon encounter. What is a blood avenger? Is that the family? I will be the, the family, the member of the family designated by the family that has uh, been the object of the, of the, um, the murderous attack. So this is the, some relative or other of the, of the person who was killed. Uh, so let, I wanted to look, look at this part because there's a lot of attention paid to what kind of weapon um, or what kind of implement, I should probably say, uh, was used. What do you think that the uh, interest of, of the Torah might be in distinguishing uh, or calling particular attention to whether or not it, the, the um, implement which caused, uh, which was used in the murderous attack was you know, iron, or stone or wood, what have you, what would be the reason for uh, making some distinctions along those lines. But the result is the same with all of them. Yes, they all result in the death of the, of the individual. Um, but it's, that kind of underscores point, they all result in the same outcome. Namely yeah, death. so it eliminates the possibility of an excuse. How does it do that? Well, I didn't hit him with a iron. I hit him with my fist. So you can't use that as an excuse. Well, I, I have a, a slightly, I mean, I, I just, you can't, I think we, I can't talk about this without talking about what happened yesterday. Uh, that's because, interesting. Okay, go ahead. Right, because I'm wondering, you know, did people come in with intention or no intention? That's the point. And did they come in, was it accidental? Did they use a fist? Did they use a, a stick? Did they use, you know, so we have two things, intention, no intention, weapon, what type of weapon? All right, so I want to start by looking at the distinctions from different kinds of weapons. Because the outcome is the same and somebody dies from this uh, murderous attack. What difference does it make whether or not the implement that's used is made out of iron or stone or some other, any other material. Well, aren't some weapons more lethal than other weapons? And uh, when you plan for something like that, uh, depending upon what you use and what you choose, uh, wouldn't that also speak to the level of intention of committing that crime? So depending upon the weapon, you might get a clue as to what the intent was. Well, yes and no, because you can have somebody use a car as a murderous weapon, and you can have a car hit somebody and kill somebody as manslaughter. So, so right, the, an accident. In that case, the, the, uh, the implement doesn't necessarily give you a clue as to what the intent was. Um, I'm just throwing that out there. No, so. I, think it, I think that's a good distinction. The, the reason that I'm asking is that in law in general, in, in our own legal system, we make 
a, uh, a distinction, let's say between robbery and armed robbery, or uh, some other, when some, some uh, lethal weapon is used, the implication is that it is to be punished more seriously. That because exactly it would imply something about the intent. Oh, These people will never learn. They will never learn. Um, the the uh, it implies something about what the intent was. So let's start out with this question about intent. The, the, if you're dealing with with somebody who uh, commits a murder. Under what conditions would intent make a difference? But look at the last verse, uh, uh, the paragraph above 15, okay. uh, where it actually mentions intention. Uh, the six cities shall serve, as, uh, serve the Israelites and resident aliens among them for refuge so that anyone who kills a person unintentionally right. may flee there. Well, so, so I think that starting with 16 with the different implements, I think the implication is those are all intentional to cause harm, not necessarily death, but to cause harm. So if you use an iron implement, the implication is that you mean some sort, you have some sort of intent to cause harm or to cause murder because of the nature of the weapon. Well, even so, the non-weapon ones, when you go down, uh, if he pushed him in hate or hurled something at him on purpose and death resulted. I mean, you know, the first one, you, you push somebody and uh, you, you may or may not have intended him to die, but um, it's still an intent to hurt the individual. And, and so I think intention is still there. That seems to be... To, I think, as Leslie said, that seems to be the underlying uh, unifying theme in this paragraph, that these are all intentional. You know, it's very interesting. Has anybody in this group uh, read the story of um, um, an American tragedy? Um, I'm not familiar with it. A Place in the Sun is the movie. And uh, the, the main character there uh, plans to murder, uh, actually, to get rid of uh, his um, girlfriend who is pregnant by him. And he plans to actually get rid of her uh, by taking her out on this deserted lake uh, on a canoe because she does not know how to swim. And he plans all this out with uh, how to do it and all this other kind of stuff. Yeah. And he, he even has a camera with him and he rows the boat to a deserted part of the lake, which he has planned to do. And he has mm -hmm. planned about how he's going to escape afterwards, whatever. And the last minute, he changes his mind. And the last minute, he really cannot bring himself to go through with it. Uh -huh. and she steps and she, she gets up in the boat, in the small canoe boat, and starts going towards him, which he didn't cause or anything like that. She just gets up and the boat starts to immediately uh, topsy go topsy turvy. And before you knew it, the boat overturns and she goes into the lake and so does he. And as he, and, and just before they turn over into the water, his camera inadvertently in the swing hits her in the head. Uh -huh. He did not cause the camera to whatever, but he was wearing it and the motion did cause that to happen. They both go in the water and she cannot swim. He's a very good swimmer and it, he sees her struggling and so on and so forth and does not go to her aid. Huh. So what is, it, what is the judgment that the film had? And so the book, and then uh, Theodore Dreiser is the author uh, of this book. And um, the last part of the book deals a lot with the trial and the exposure of all the information that the lawyers found and so on and so forth. And um, he was found to be guilty and mm -hmm. was electrocuted. 
Well, he was electrocuted and uh, they and even though it was, you know, what I told you did take place, apparently the final verdict said that the last moments of the struggling young woman who was in the water, uh, the fact that he did not attempt to try to save her in any way, because according to the lawyer, he was thinking of something else that he wanted in life so badly that he would not have been able to have unless this young woman died. So the last minute, so that he, because he didn't, so because there was murder in his heart, quote unquote, yeah. he was, yeah, he got punished. Rabbi? So found guilty. Rabbi? It sounds like it was a just uh, conclusion. Um, in the in that in that instance, the the relative the central issue of his intention has to do with whether or not he is focused on the situation that he's caused. Uh -huh. But he seems to be dislocated for Kirby. Yeah. Uh Verse 20 might be pertinent to the discussion of intent. Uh, in my translation, the NIV, uh, verse 20 reads, if, if anyone with malice aforethought shoves another or throws something at them intentionally so that they die, uh, uh, then, then they can be put to death. That suggests to me that if you shoved someone and threw someone, but not intentionally, then they would not be put to death. They would not be accused as a murderer. A slight distinction there. Well, there, it, it's, it may even be more than a slight distinction because we're dealing with a section having to do with the cities of refuge. And the purpose of the cities of refuge is to provide refuge for people who are, are guilty of manslaughter, not necessarily murder. The, 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 it's meant to deal with with situations where the the death is inadvertent, so the question of it, of intent becomes very important. Yes, then. Yeah, I was just building on what Kirby said. Um, I'm sure there were people who were trampled to death in Pompeii, for example, uh, when they tried to flee when Vesuvius went off. And again, I think that fits what Kirby was talking about: non-intentional uh, pushing or shoving trampling uh, on someone uh, because the person who did it was panicking, not because they intended to cause harm. Well, th that is an interesting point because the question of, of whether or not uh, if this is the, in the intent or the action of an individual rather than a group would come into play. You know, in the case of, of uh, Pompeii or one of these uh, soccer deaths where the crowd goes nuts because of the outcome and people are trampled to death in, uh, in uh, such a situation. It's much harder to determine whether or not any one is particularly or uniquely responsible. Well, in these cases, we're talking about uh, someone who is identified as being the responsible party, one who uh, causes the death by, by pushing or shoving or by using a weapon or whatever it may be. It, uh, the oh, question, I, yeah, go ahead, Judy. I was just thinking about the Chappaquiddick incident with Ted Kennedy. Uh, he, he was inebriated at the time. Right. And uh, he yet went, got into a car with uh, um, one of his aides, a woman, and- um, they yeah, and that's right, Kopechny, and uh, drove off uh, into the wrong direction towards uh, a dangerous road, which led into uh, a dangerous situation where the car actually went into the water, as we all know from all the publicity. And, uh, and at that point in time, uh, he was able to get out of the car and uh, in the water and save himself. What happened? in terms of could he have come to the aid of the young woman or not? 
uh, there were various things that were said about that. How responsible was he? Well, that was one. That was a good example of where the question, which is like the movie example you came up with, has to do with whether or not there was an opportunity or a uh, possibility of going, going <laughs> back and being helpful. That, that uh, it would have made a difference uh, in both in, in the Chappaquiddick incident and in the uh, the movie that you're talking about, whether or not the person who created the dangerous situation mm -hmm. with in evil intent, bad intent, um, whether they had taken advantage of any opportunity uh, to save or aid the person involved. And, and in addition to that, uh, I think he waited for many hours before reporting the incident. And uh, from what I understand, that was maybe done for a number of reasons, including the fact that his blood alcohol level would have made him perhaps uh, more culpable. I mean, there were a lot of reasons that he did not report the incident. Yes, there were. Uh, in the case that we're, cases we're looking at here, in the Torah text, the analogies are not uh, very, uh, very strong because in all of them, we don't get any information on all of them. In, in the majority of them, we don't get any information about what the motivation of the, the pursuer was. We just give the information that they uh, used some kind of weapon or, or uh, dangerous tool in order to implement the desire to kill somebody, but we have no idea why uh, the person uh, was intent on killing this other person, or and we don't know if they have any remorse or any uh, regret for having done so. Those kinds of psychological or emotional aspects are left out of these cases. So you know, it would be a question to deal with uh, whether or not, if, if there is some reason why the Torah um, concentrates on just whether or not the um, there was intent to kill the person without knowing what the, the reason or the impetus was. Any thoughts about that? Yeah, that's a... Well, just think about yesterday. Okay, we had this mob, right? And they didn't go to kill. I mean, I'm assuming that not everybody went to kill. Some people went because it was this mob crazy. Yeah. But along the way, they might have smashed something. And that would have caused the death of someone. Mm -hmm. Where is that? They were acting, I mean, they did it as an individual. They didn't go there with the intention of really kill, of killing anybody, maybe to threaten. This happens. It's part of the mob rule. You know, is it manslaughter or did they, you know, and they threw a rock at a, at a window and instead they thought they'd just break the window and it hit somebody else. Was, what's the intention there? Well, it's very difficult to determine intention in a lot of cases, certainly the ones yesterday are good, good examples of that. The question, I guess, is, as a, a, put it more generally, is what role or what um, impact does the intention of the person who commits the murderous act, how is that relevant or not relevant to the disposition of the case? Does it matter whether or not that person has good reasons to uh, want to eliminate the other person? Does it matter whether they meant to or not? Well, that goes back to all those cases that came up in the 1980s about women murdering their um, their abusive husbands. Yeah. Remember that? And they would take so much abuse and then finally they would turn around and kill them. And then they had to, they went on trial for murder and people said, well, it really wasn't murder because they were protecting themselves. Right. Remember all of that. And that, that would, that, I don't know if that falls in here, but where would, so they were found innocent. Basically, a lot of them were found innocent on this basis. So I guess they wouldn't have entered, they wouldn't have been guilty then, right? 
Yes. But well, I mean, it, looking at from that point of view, those are cases where the intent was really the crux around which the whole case revolved because the same actions on the part of these women, if let's say the husband had not been abusive, would have been murder. The, so the, the fact that there was abuse and it was regular and uh, intense and so on and so forth changes the nature of the case. Yeah, Kirby. It seems like the Torah is, is making a distinction here. If you hold something in your hand or if you use your fist and that results in murder, but if you shove or throw, that seems to be less in hit, less dangerous or, 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 or less inciting with regard to intent. It seems like a distinction is being made here by the Torah. Well, there are distinctions that are being made. You're right. Uh, that may be one of them. There's a number of the possibilities. Stan. Yeah, actually, uh, if you go one, two more verses in uh, beyond what we did, 22 says, um, but if he pushed him without malice of forethought or hurled any object at him unintentionally or inadvertently uh, dropped upon him any object, stone, uh, and death resulted, though he was not an enemy of his and did not seek his harm, in such cases, the assembly shall decide between the slayer and the blood avenger. What do you take that to mean, Stan? That gets us uh, uh, down to through verse 24. No, but what, what difference does it make whether or not there was malice or forethought? Well, they're describing a situation where there was a history of conflict or tension or a, a disagreement of some kind. And the, the, uh, the act, though in the motion, in the moment, might not have been uh, uh, marked by murderous intent. What do you do if you, you maybe you can't uh, prove that the per person at that moment meant to kill the, uh, the victim, but given a history of conflict, that might change your estimation of what their intent was. So then it might be thought of as being inadvertent in one, under one set of circumstances, might now look much more suspicious, even if it was not necessarily the conscious intent of the slayer. So you've got another dimension now. It's there, we begin with the notion that the nature of the weapon gives us a clue about what the intention of the slayer was. Uh, we also look at the history of their relationship. And that history gives us some information on what the intention of the slayer was. To me, it seems very interesting that we would even go there because it's not, the argument is not being made that this forms uh, or leads to the formation of a conscious intent to commit murder. If the weapon but, is held, that implies intent in the Torah. Say that again. That, that's, that's the only conclusion I can draw from this. If the weapon is held, that's intent. Well, but it also matters whether or not the intent, the, uh, the, the weapon is iron or stone or some other kind of material, which in and of itself would not necessarily indicate anything about intent. You can hold a, a stone in your hand for all sorts of benign reasons. It's just a stone. Maybe it's you're using, one o'clock. Maybe you're using it to, uh, to beat your laundry at the side of the river. I mean, who knows what it might be? There, the question uh, besides uh, holding the, the weapon in hand, which I, which I agree with, Kirby, um, has some, something to do with what, how it's going to be used. So let's say, for example, 
I just alluded to the possibility. Now you see pictures of uh, people who are doing their laundry uh, by the side of the Ganges River. And what they're doing is beating the laundry with a rock. That's, that's the, uh, the device they have to, uh, that's to create agitation, to, cl to clean the laundry. That's a very benign act. It's an everyday act. But that same everyday act, given some other kind of intent, might look exactly the same, but might demonstrate a different purpose in mind. So let's say um, in our own uh, world, we have uh, somebody who is carrying an empty revolver and swing, you know, uh, waves it around and the intent might be to scare a person into changing their behavior. But it turns out that the gun inadvertently was loaded and a shot goes off and the person results in the death of the person that was only meant to be scared. Are you still responsible if your intent was not intentionally formed as a murderous oh, intent? All right, thanks. So the, que the question that I'm raising here is, there's a complex of explanations of having to do with the nature of the weapon, the nature of the uh, the act itself, the emotional or psychological uh, motivation that the, the, the slayer has, all of these things come into play. It starts getting very complicated. And now, if we're talking about the, uh, the cities of refuge, the question of these questions seem to be much more simply understood is you know, if you uh, kill somebody and it was not your intent to kill them, you are uh, eligible to go to one of the cities of refuge and receive um, protection. How, see, it, it come, what comes to my mind is how difficult it is, especially as we multiply uh, possible elements of causation, how difficult it is to get a very good idea of what somebody's purpose was in creating whatever the dangerous, dangerous situation was that resulted in the, uh, the death of an individual. It seems in a lot of these though, that purpose is not a, not a factor. Your action resulted in a certain um, death, and so that then you need you need to pay for that with an equal with your own death. So, so why would it? Why would that be so, Kurt? I mean, what is the? Well, you've talked before about how action is so important in Judaism. Yes, as opposed to intention. And that if even like if you do something good, but with the wrong intention, it's still a good deed. One of the things that we notice in this section is that uh, in many of the cases that are brought forward, uh, we either can't determine the intention or the intention is convoluted, complicated. And, there, and we don't know necessarily what factors are relevant and what factors are irrelevant. You now you, you push somebody and you shove somebody, uh, you're standing on the platform of the Broadway IRT and you, the, the train is coming and you push somebody off of the platform and they fall on the tracks right in front of the train and are killed as a result. Well. At that moment, 
as you as the person is acting in that way. It may not even be clear to the to the slayer himself or herself of why they're doing it. It's the act of anger or the summation of years of frustration or rivalry or competition or what have you, the opportunity to get rid of this person presents itself. And without even considering it deep, deeply, the person takes advantage of the situation. Is that different than somebody who says, uh, you know, I've been meaning to get, get rid of this person for years. Here's my opportunity. Now's the time I'll push them in front of the oncoming train. Well, in our law, we have this idea of premeditated murder as opposed to okay, just just an angry outburst, and that that is seems to be a worse crime. The question of determining whether or not an act like this is premeditated or not is a, a huge complication because what we're talking about is trying to figure out what the the emotional the internal motive for the action is we may never really know that it seems to me that not being able to, deter to determine the motive clearly or uh, uh, with, with, with great uh, precision would make a huge difference. What well, I, I think this is saying that it doesn't, that the result of the loss of life is what's essential and not why that life was lost. Well, I think, I think that that's true. Stan, I see your hand. Um, in, because you cannot determine the particular intention Taking that into account is a convoluting factor that really doesn't help you very much in determining uh, what the the uh, the content that the act was. Yeah, I tell you, hand. Yeah, uh, can you bring up since we've got it on the screen, verse twenty-two? Sure. Okay, it says so. Now the, this is right after uh, he's a murderer put to death. Um, but then we get into the question of intent because, but if he pushed him without malice of forethought. So I think the intent of the ones before that where they're all to be put to death, I think those are considered with malice of forethought uh -huh. because of the word, but I don't know, it probably would be a good idea uh, to hear your exact translation of that part of verse 22. Well, all right, let's 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 take a look at the larger question first. Um, what would, what factors would you look at to determine whether or not uh, there was malice or forethought? That is to say, there was a pre-existing uh, mental construct that the slayer had which would account for their their actions in in uh, endangering the life of this individual. Uh, we look at the history of their relationship. You might look at uh, past events and say, well, they have had this kind of conflict or that kind of conflict for many years. You might look and see whether or not there were um, uh, conflicts that were uh, that had been left unresolved. Say, what is it there? Well, I was going to say the other thing also you can look at is the immediate circumstances prior to the act. Uh, what built up to the point where the person picks up the stone or shoves someone or whatever. Uh, it, it, usually those things don't happen in a vacuum. Um, and, and the, the, I think that would maybe give a clue to what's in the perpetrator's mind. I think that the, those are all relevant factors, 
But if you if the issue is whether or not somebody is going to get protection from the inclination of some uh, family member to to kill the slayer because of what they did to their fellow family member, you'd have to have some sort of relatively clear way of understanding what the motivation was. I think in the, what we see here is that it's very difficult to determine what the motivation was. Uh, we might have a number of different possibilities in mind, uh, several of which might fit the case. But remember, if those possibilities are used for determining whether or not an individual gets the protection of the, the cities of refuge or not, there is now a, a new set of factors and new set of individuals who have become directly or indirectly complicit. And that is the community. The community or the legal system now is making a determination about what the the what is relevant and what is not relevant about the actions of the slayer. And these uh, factors are used to determine whether or not the individual gets protection or does not get protection. If you're wrong about what the motivation was or what the intent was, then aren't you in some way uh, facilitating the death of the slayer? You know, if, if, there's, you, if you can't determine the intention with any precision, maybe it's better not to take that into account. It doesn't matter what explanation or, or excuse is given for a number of reasons. Uh, maybe it's, it's uh, an, a post facto uh, uh, explanation or res uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, a later attempt to explain what you have done, but you might not have really had that in mind in, in any clear way as the act was being uh, executed. Well, this brings to mind the notion of, and I know we talked about this before, of, uh -huh. wit of witnesses, that uh, in Judaism, it is very important yeah. to have uh, that the death penalty is very is taken very seriously, and yes. only under very stringent conditions is it applied. And uh, so, therefore, the notion of witnesses comes in. Um, yes. I think that's many, a very good point. And and what why would it make a difference whether or not you have two or three witnesses, or you only have one witness in a uh, capital murder case. What is added to the explanation of the behavior by having a multiplicity of, of witnesses? Why would that be useful? Because then it's not one person. He said, she said. Yes. I mean, but, but these, these really are more than witnesses. They're supposed to warn the person. Yes. And again, that, seem, that seems important. And why would it be important, Kim? I think it is. But what, because, what do you, what do you well, think? in terms of the the survival of the community, it gives people a chance not to act in that way. Because yeah. So if the, the issue of the the participation of the you could avoid you could avoid the situation, or you could stop it. Well, I mean, I think it, it gives the the question of what sort of uh, connection. The community has. Now, let's say somebody is a slayer, and there are members of the community who can attest to what was actually done. And let's say they keep quiet. Doesn't that make them, in some ways, complicit in the death of this 
uh, Slayer. And isn't this now moving in the direction of being uh, a, a more serious sort of crime? Because it involved all sorts of people who had the opportunity to prevent the death of the, of the Slayer, which they'll take advantage of. If you, uh, you know, you could think of this very famous verse, you know, that the, you can't stand by idly while your neighbor bleeds. In other words, the idea of whether or not you are, uh, you become yourself a, a character in the story that's being examined, the story of the, the, uh, the slayer and the person who is who's slain. Okay, 116, thank you. Uh, uh, in, in the cases here, where some of them have to do with, among the features that are important, whether or not there is a kind of past, a kind of history that might point towards why somebody would have acted or would not have acted in defense of the slayer. Um, there are others that you can even imagine that are not mentioned here. Maybe fear of reprisal might come into, into case. Uh, but be that as it may, as Tim has so helpfully pointed out, it's 116 and time to say goodbye. <laughs> for today. Uh, so we'll pick it up at the end of this next time. Uh, any uh, importing, important parting shots from anybody? No, I'm just curious whether we're still today in our legal system following this or if well, there's a that, difference. That is a question I think is very well worth considering. We do make distinctions about whether or not uh, a crime is committed using a weapon or not using a weapon, what kind of weapon is used, so forth. Think of the difference between burglary and armed robbery, ar armed robbery, so forth. But, but this is exactly the kind of the next step that would be interesting to talk about. All right, everybody. Thank you. Uh, thank you for coming, and we thank will you. meet again next week. Next week. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Bye Leslie. Bye. 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 Bye